Uh, mobile devices are fantastic, aren't they? Take my smartphone, for example. I can go to a trade show and do photos and interviews and all kinds of extra fun stuff using and carrying my smartphone. Oh, and a big extra USB battery. And, well, yes, another extra battery and a charging cord and a power adapter and an extra USB charging cable because I always seem to lose at least one. You know what? Battery life is a problem. But before we go cramming even bigger batteries into our portable devices, maybe we should consider the other end of the equation. Wouldn't it be nice if our systems actually used less power? I can feel you're with me here. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today my guest is Nick Yomzievsky from NXP, and we're going to talk about processors that use way less energy. Goodbye, booster battery. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about the i.mx 7ULP applications processor from NXP. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Okay, so we are here to talk about battery life. Now, Nick, why do my batteries always die so fast? What's going on here? So really, the answer is simple here. We use our devices more and more. At the same time, these devices that we're using, they have much more features in them than previously. We have connected devices. We have devices that have beautiful LCD, rich graphics. So really, all in all, it really turns into a device that gets drained pretty fast and really makes us unhappy. We have this fear of missing out. And if you look at all of these devices that are coming out, every single one of them has a battery life. And we would really be upset if every single one of these devices gets drained. Okay, so what can we do to make my batteries last longer? Well, there's a couple things that we can do. We can make the battery bigger, really. If you make the battery bigger, you have a device that lasts longer. But what's the downside of that? The cost goes up. The bigger the battery, the more it costs. And the batteries weigh a lot in products as well. So those are a couple things that are unfortunate about having the battery bigger. The other thing that you can do is make the processor and the software more efficient. And what's the benefit there? Well, the costs go down because the battery can be smaller now and the weight goes down as well. Well, I don't want to make the battery bigger, so how can we make the processor and the software more efficient? So there's several ways that you can make the processor and software be more efficient. Firstly, you can use the right process technology, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. As well as the power domain architecture can be smarter, the way we design these architectures inside of the SOCs. Altogether, it's controlled by software, so the software has to be smarter, it has to be aware of what's going on and what the product it needs to do all the time. And last but not least, you have the certain choices that you make when you build your SOCs, your microprocessors. And that's really use the right IP, use the right blocks inside of there. Okay, let's dive into each of these, starting with the process technology. So we've seen process technologies, really the width of the traces that you draw your processes with go down and down. So we've seen it go down from 60 nanometer, 40 nanometer, down to 28, and we're definitely driving that further down. Why does that matter? Well, if we think about it, back in school, we learned about dynamic power, I squared R. So when you reduce the resistance, you really reduce the power. Also, at the same time, we need to be aware of leakage. Leakage is bad. Our transistors leak. When we have them on, they leak. So we need to do a couple things. We need to build them better and actually turn them off as much as possible. So what is NXP doing to stop that leakage? Well, we talked about process technology, and those two things go hand in hand. We are leveraging the use of FDSOI, fully depleted silicon on insulator. And this is a process technology where we've added an ultra-thin buried oxide layer in between the body and the source and the drain. And if you look at the left side of the transistor cross-section, you see the bulk transistor. You see a lot of electrons leaking from source to drain. They have plenty of opportunity to do so. But putting that ultra-thin buried oxide layer, you've limited the space that the electrons can leak. So naturally, they leak less. So that's the first benefit of FTSOI. The second is the ability to bias the body. So that's what we call either forward body biasing or reverse body biasing the ability to apply a voltage on the backside of the transistor. So you hear on the bottom, you see a tap 
the V bias tap and you can apply a negative or a positive voltage there. What was it all do? By applying a positive voltage, you see that you can speed up the transistor or you can keep the speed of the transistor the same but lower the threshold and the VDD voltages. And if you apply a negative voltage there, you really shut down the leakage even further down. So these are the two benefits there. As you can see this graph, you have a normal operating point, and if you go up on this curve, you go into the forward body biasing region, which really speeds up the transistor, but it also increases the leakage. But if you don't care much about the speed of the transistor, you can lower the leakage by applying the RBB, the reverse body biasing. Okay, so let's move down your list a little more and talk about power domain architecture. That's one of the key things of MPU design, how you're going to design your SOC. How are you going to build your SOC? You have to really maximize the number of gated silicon to limit this leakage that we talked about. So if you're not going to be using a transistor, shut it down. Let it not leak. I think that's the biggest advantage that you have when you design power-efficient MPUs. And also, you have the benefit of heterogeneous computing. By mixing the Cortex-A domain and the Cortex-M domains inside of an SOC, you have the ability to choose the right core for the use case. And if you have the ability to choose the Cortex-M4, you don't need the Cortex-A core, so why not shut it down? So if you think about an MPU, you have a benefit of running rich OSs on top of microprocessor. Really an ability to leverage the Neon Arc acceleration on there, so you have a high bandwidth system with an MMU. For a microcontroller, you have the ability to run real-time operating systems on an MCU, and obviously have extreme low power modes as we've seen in the past. What the idea here is to bring both those in a single device with an application domain and a real-time domain. So for your rich OS applications, you can connect performance peripherals. For your real-time applications, you can connect the low-power peripherals. So together, they're going to be a heterogeneous domain-based computing architecture. And really, this is important if you look at the application domain, because then you can turn off the application domain while running on the real-time domain. It gives you an ability to turn all those transistors that you're not using and basically get rid of that leakage, which is bad. Okay, Nick, so what does this look like in a real use case? Let's take an example use case. Let's take a smartwatch or a medical device. We have a lot of different power modes. So for a power mode where a user has to interact with the device, both A7 and the M4 are running. And potentially you don't want to interact with the device, but really you still have that sensor hub running. So the A7 now can be gated and the M4 can be running. And for those times when your sensor hub or user action is not needed, you can go into the deep sleep mode and you do that over and over again. And it's really all about lowering the area under the curve as we've learned in school with the average power equation above. So what about IP choices? Does that affect power consumption? So as we've mentioned before, IP choices are very critical. We tried to connect the high performance peripherals to the A7 side and the low power peripherals to the M4 side. One of the biggest performing peripherals that we're going to connect in the SOC is the GPU. So this is a very critical piece of hardware that we have inside of our microprocessor that really accelerates graphics, but it can also take up a lot of power. For your device, you need to choose the right-sized architecture. For the ultra-low power family, we've chosen the GC7000 Nano Ultra series. So what does that mean? That means that we're not going to be supporting 4K, 5K devices. We're going to be supporting smaller LCDs, but we're going to make sure that they're accelerated and they are low power. So how has this been working for you? It's been working great. We've had a couple of different architectures in the past where we've concentrated on low power, such as the iDynamic 6 Solo Lite and the iDynamic 7 Solo. So as you can see, we've leveraged our experience from years past in these designs to really get down to a 5% standby power level as compared to the original iDynamic 6 Solo Lite. At the same time, if you look at the runtime power, we've really made great progress there. So as you can see on both the standby power and the runtime power, Really, we're trending in the right direction. Now, Nick, how does this all fit into the NXP portfolio? So in the past, we've had a huge scalable family called the iDynamic 6. And in every roadmap, you go upwards to the right. What we feel like is there's an opportunity for us to fill this gap below where the low power use cases really are requiring 
extra low power processing. So we're going to put the iDynamics 7 family along with the 7 ULP down below where we really are concentrating on nothing but power and really performance comes second. Power always comes first here. And this really fits in nicely with our best of both worlds strategy where we have the MCU world, the application processor world, and the 7 ULP fits right in with the heterogeneous architecture. We're going to have a lot of customers coming up from the MCU world and a lot of customers coming down from the application processor world, just as the iDynamix RT is seeing. So in summary, what we're really doing is we're bringing together the app's processor performance with MCU low power. We're providing ultra low power through the right architecture, process technology, as well as efficient graphics, not only providing the 3D GPU, but also the 2D GPU, which really can extend power efficiency. At the same time, we are designing our processors with heterogeneous computing in mind, providing multiple software execution with software integrity and security. Okay, so Nick, can we take a look at the 7ULP and see what it's all about? So the 7ULP is a great device. It has plenty of things to offer. One thing that I want to know about our block diagram is that we're drawing it a little bit differently from other products. We're putting all the peripherals that are connected in the application power domain up above and all the peripherals that are connected to the real-time domain down below. And that really gives our customers, users, an ability to quickly identify which peripherals, which resources they're going to have access to once they shut down the application domain. Because this is really key to lowering power, being smart about which transistors you keep up and which transistors you shut down. Excellent. This is super exciting. Now, Nick, how exactly would I get started? Well, the good news is that you can definitely go to nxp.com where you'll find a plethora of information on the 7 ULP. Documentation, schematics, layout files, BOM, BSB, and SDK. As you can see, you can also purchase the iDynamix 7 ULP EVK, which is also optimized for power and optimized for a four-layer board design to really cut down on the cost. Excellent. Well, I'm going to click that link right there and go to a mauser.com page for more information. But Nick, I think that's all about the time I have today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Amelia. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about the i.mx 7ULP applications processor from NXP. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from E journal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. Can't miss it right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube. Keyword EE Journal.